man. And so it is, it is a joy to be here with each and every one of you. And I want to share today on this topic. If you could turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. And we're going to read verses 14 through verse 21. Matthew chapter 17, verse 14 through verse 21. you want to look at the scriptures through your phone, that's great. Through your physical Bible, that's great. It's also on the screen here. And while you're turning, we just want to thank those who are watching uh, online, who are joining us via social media, who are watching us at a later date. The Lord bless you. May the word of the Lord minister unto you that which you need today. Praise the Lord. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 17. And we're going to read here. Verse 14 through 21. Amen. And so look at what the word of the Lord is saying here. The Bible says, and when they were come to the multitude, there came unto him a certain man kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. And for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. Look at verse 16 here. And I brought him to thy disciples, he's speaking to Jesus. I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart or privately and said, why could we, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. How be it? Somebody say, how be it? How be it? How be it? This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Today I want to share on the topic entitled Fast For It. Fast For It. Bow your heads. Father, we thank you this afternoon for this moment that we can worship you. Thank you for this opportunity to worship you. We thank you for your presence that is here. We thank you for your anointing that is here. And we pray, oh God, in the name of Jesus, that you would speak by your divine spirit. We pray that it would be only your voice that we hear, that we wouldn't hear anything else except your voice. And so speak by your spirit, we pray, and minister to every hearer, minister to every listener, minister to every viewer according to your will and purpose. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we all say, amen. Praise the Lord. So today I want to share on the topic called Fast For It, Fast For It. Now, fasting is an opportunity that every believer must take advantage of. And many people have their opinion about what fasting is. Others don't really even consider fasting a part of their Christian experience. But we want to look at the role of fasting and how it is impacted or, or, or the role it has played historically. And we want to also look at the role of fasting through scripture. And we need to, and, and we therefore want to employ how we can use it for the maximum benefit of our lives. Now, generally speaking, many believers do, do not believe themselves to be spiritually powerful or apt. 
And we tend to undervalue or maybe we don't realize all that God has provided for us and has poured into us through Christ Jesus. You see, and there are a variety of spiritual tools that release victory in our lives. Some of those tools are the following. The word of God, that's a, that's a powerful tool that releases victory in our lives. Amen? Prayer is a powerful tool that releases victory in our lives when we pray. Walking by faith, activating faith is a powerful tool that releases victory in our lives. When we worship the Lord, that is a massively powerful tool that releases the glory, the power, and the presence of God, and therefore victory in our lives. But the fact of the matter is all of these tools that we mentioned, all of these spiritual exercises that I mentioned, these tools given to us by God are not singular in application. In other words, we shouldn't pray only but not read the word. Amen? And we shouldn't read the word, but then, you know what, I, I don't pray. I, j I just read my Bible, but I don't pray. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be like that. I mean, we, we, we shouldn't just do one thing. We shouldn't just worship God, but, but, but you know, I, I worship God, and I, 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 I read my Bible, but I don't pray. Like, we, we, we shouldn't just, we, we cannot apply the spiritual exercises, the tools that God has given us, and just do one thing and not do the other. All of these tools must be done or used in conjunction one with another. Amen? Amen. It's almost like your favorite recipe. You can't just leave the key ingredient out. Mm -hmm. Do not invite me over to your house for curry chicken and there's no curry on the chicken. Mm -hmm. Amen? Don't, do, you know, please don't invite me over for escovish fish and there's no vinegar in there. Mm -hmm. We can't leave out certain things, amen? amen? And the same thing applies to our spiritual life. We must use it all. And one of the key ingredients, along with reading the word, along with worshiping the Lord, along with uh, a prayer, one of the ingredients that we need to add into our Christian experience is fasting. Yes, amen. To fast is to eat sparingly or to abstain from eating altogether. Now think about what I just said. And think about the world that we live in today, amen? <laughs> think about that in contrast of the world we live in. To fast is to, is to eat sparingly or to abstain from eating altogether. And we currently, you know, in saying that, when you think about, what, you know, this world that we live in here, in, in, in the West specifically, you can go five minutes in any direction and find food. Go, go north, south, east, you go five minutes, any direction, you will find something to eat, amen? amen? Therefore, fasting is not particularly popular in the context of fasting for spiritual purposes. There are, there are, there are people who fast for diet, but in terms of fasting for a spiritual reason, it is not popular anymore. But the fact of the matter is that there are issues that we must fast for, amen? Amen? Look at your neighbor and say, fast for it. Fast for it. Fast for it. Now, when I say fast for it, I'm, I'm not encouraging us to fast when we feel like we need something from God, but rather we fast to be in, to be in a consistent position of power. Yes. That's why we fast. To be, in a, to be in a consistent position of power. When you look at what fasting is historically, historically, even outside of scripture, fasting was a part of a morning ritual. Not, not in terms of waking up in the morning, but in terms of mourning loss and, and burying people and, and death. Uh, his, historically, fasting was a morning ritual. It was a public display of, of grief, of, of anguish. In contrast to that, feasting and that they would be a display of wealth and success. 
But the opposite of that would be would be fasting, where 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 if you saw somebody fasting, you would say, okay, something happened. And we see this type of fasting in the Old Testament. When you read about mighty kings or mighty prophets who died, the people would mourn when Moses' brother Aaron died. They mourned for many days and they did not travel. They mourned and they did not eat. And, and scripturally in the Old Testament, you'd read about people who would uh, mourn by tearing sackcloth and, and throwing ashes on their head. And they would abstain from food for a certain amount of days. And fasting in the Old Testament was also undertaken not only for mourning, but also to seek God for repentance, to seek him in repentance and to seek him for deliverance. When you read about David after his, after his entanglement with Bathsheba, you will read that David fasted for God to save the life of the child. And there was David on the floor and he would not touch food. And he literally laid before the Lord, fasting and praying, saying, Lord, will you spare this child? The child didn't make it. And David got up and said, how is it? How is it? How is it that you just got up and, and, and out of nowhere you're okay? He said, well, look, maybe God would have mercy. He fasted and he prayed. Daniel fasted in repentance for the turning of Israel away from the Lord. He sought God in fasting, denying himself food, repenting and, and relenting the turning of Israel away from the Lord. We read that in the Old Testament, Israel also fasted to thwart famine. If there was famine, they fasted and they sought the Lord for rain. They also fasted and they sought the Lord for success in battle. Whenever kings would show up on their borders, they would cry out to God in fasting and mourning, seeking God to do a work. And so we see that overall in the Old Testament, that fasting became a static cultural expression. If something happened, you would fast. You would mourn. And it was almost as if people would fast just because there seemed to be no better way in currying God's favor. We read that fasting indeed was an indication of loss, of sadness. Fasting, it was a sign of desperate need. But that is not what fasting is for us today. Amen? Therefore, some suggest that fasting in the Old Testament was abused in certain cases rather than it being an act of humbleness or self-renunciation and submission to God. It became a dead ritual. And thus, this is the same attitude that we see progress into the New Testament, where when you look in the New Testament at fasting, fasting was not so much a type of mourning anymore. People, when you read about the Pharisees and you read about the religious sects and how they would fast, fasting in the New Testament now became deeply ritualistic. Vows were made when you fast. You would make a vow and you would fast. The Bible talks about the Apostle Paul as he was preaching the gospel, doing great work. And the Jews were so mad. They said, look, <laughs> I mean, they said, look, we will not eat until we kill Paul. What a stupid vow to make. They must have died. People literally would make vows and they would fast. In the New Testament, they held special days of fasting, which made fasting to be a public spectacle. Jesus later taught in the New Testament. He said, he said, remember, remember what Jesus said? He said to the disciples, when you fast, don't squeeze up your face and sat in your face to, to try to show that you are so pious and that you're suffering for the name of the Lord. But he said, he said, wash your face. He said, anoint your face with some lotion or oil, and he said, do not, do not show to men that you are fasting. The fact that Jesus had to teach against this type of fasting where men would droop their face and, oh, he must be fasting, oh, look at you. The fact that Jesus taught had to teach this wow. reveals to us how prevalent the issue of prideful fasting was. 
It became an empty ritual that carried no impact because fasting was observed from a place of selfishness rather than from a place of selflessness. So therefore, fasting is universally understood to be founded on humbleness. But the religious order of the day made it into an opportunity to be pridefully humble. How many people know that it is possible to be pridely, to, to be pridely humble? Mm -hmm. It's possible to be pridefully humble. Do you ever encounter somebody who is so humble that they, that they just have to mention to you how they help somebody else? You ever seen that? Well, you know, yeah, and he's a good person. You know, and that's why, you know, I, I bought him dinner that day, you know, and I just stopped by his house and, you know. It's like prideful humbleness. People who want to help others to make themselves feel better. That is prideful humbleness. But as the ministry of Jesus was about to begin, Jesus completely changed the purpose of fasting. Jesus completely changed what fasting was by way of what he did. We see a major shift in what fasting is after Jesus was baptized. The Bible says in Matthew 4, says in Matthew 4 that after Jesus was baptized, in Matthew 4, the Bible says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter, sorry, and I'm sorry. Yes, and when the tempter came to him. And so we are reading here in Matthew 4, that the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness to fast in preparation for what he would face. Amen? Amen. Now, it's important to remember when we read this passage that the Father, the Heavenly Father, was about to take Jesus' ministry to a whole new level. Up until this point, we didn't see Jesus do many miracles. I think the only miracle Jesus did up until this point was turn water into wine. But he wasn't out there doing many mighty miracles. This is right before the Heavenly Father was going to take Jesus' ministry to a new level. Listen, anytime God is going to take you to a new level, you will have to go through your wilderness. My God. Anytime God is going to take you to a new level, you will have to go through your wilderness. You will have to go through your test. Because if you are not tested, if you are not vetted, if you are not verified, if you are not tried, you won't stay where God is about to take you. Amen? Amen. And so your wilderness is an opportunity for your promotion. Yes. Ooh. Your wilderness is an opportunity for your promotion. And I'm sure you've heard this before. New levels means devils. new devils. The higher you go, you're going to face something new. The deeper in the Lord you go, you're going to face something you've never encountered. And so the father was saying, okay, okay, Jesus, I'm about to take you to a new level. You need to go into the wilderness and prepare yourself for what I'm about to do in your life. <laughs> you see, you ask God for more. We ask God to go higher. We ask God to, we want to go deeper. Well, this is it. You have to go through your wilderness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus entered a fast at the leading of the Holy Spirit. We also learn, therefore, that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. He was led by the Spirit. We also learn that there are times in your life where the Holy Spirit will lead you to fast. Mm -hmm. But what generally happens for most believers is we don't consider fasting a part of our Christian experience a lot. So therefore, fasting, we are not even listening for that. Mm. So therefore, we never fast. Jesus. Because we're not really considering fasting as a actual, regular part of our Christian exercise. But there are moments where the Spirit of God will lead you to fast. Mm -hmm. 
Now note that Jesus did not enter into this fast because of need. Jesus did not enter into this fast because he was mourning. Jesus did not enter into the wilderness to fast because he wanted the favor of God. Jesus was led into the wilderness to fast in preparation for his assignment. You see, there are some things that God has called you to do. Uh -huh. There are some things that God has called you to do. There are some levels that God has destined for you yes. to go. Yes. But in order to get there, we, we need to take time out and fast. Amen. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Come on, Pastor. Switch, switch subject. Okay. I like to okay. eat. Don't worry. I like to eat too. Yes. Don't worry. I like to eat. But guess what? There's some time where we need to turn down our plate. Amen. And we need to fast. Yes. Because I'm here to let you know that, listen, God is going to take you to some new levels. But if you really want to break through to a deeper level in him, if you really want to walk in the anointing that is in your life, there is an anointing in you. If you want to walk in that anointing, if you want to maximize the yes. gifts that God has placed in you, I want to encourage you to fast to add fasting to your prayer, add fasting to the word, add fasting to your worship, and watch what the Lord will do. Now it is here in Matthew 4, where fasting transitions from that cultural expression of mourning and or a desperate cry for God to do something special. It is here where fasting transitions into its, two, in, in, into its true purpose. And I think it's even fair to say that it's not even so much that fasting transitioned into a new purpose, but, 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 but the men and women of old did not understand the purpose and the true meaning of fasting. And Jesus, therefore, is teaching us that we need to prepare ourselves for what he has called us to do, for who he has called us to be. Yeah. And this requires fasting and prayer. And so then the question is then asked if fasting is for this preparation what are we what are we being specifically prepared for well the, this text in Matthew 4 answers this question Jesus was led up of the spirit into the wilderness, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil the father knew that the devil will come is going to show up at some point to tempt Jesus, uh -huh. to test Jesus. Uh -huh. So he said, I'm going to make sure you get ready. Uh -huh. And we see Satan tempt Jesus in the wilderness. If Jesus didn't, if Jesus didn't heed the Holy Spirit to go in the wilderness to pray, wow. Satan would have tempted it somewhere else and he would not have been ready. Uh -huh. So what is the purpose of the fasting, what are we specifically being prepared for? We are being prepared for what the enemy wants to throw at our lives. Amen? Amen. This in part is what fasting is for. To strengthen us to do what we are called to do in the face of the attack of the enemy. We, fasting prepares us to do God's work while the enemy, uh, uh, now, now, if you watch National Geographic, once a year up in Alaska, you'll see that the salmon fish, what do they do? They swim against the current. Once a year, they have to push their bodies against the current to get where they need to get. That is similar to our Christian experience where fasting strengthens us to push against the currents of the enemy to accomplish the work of God. You see, what fasting does is fasting prepares you to stand. Amen. Fasting prepares you to stand. Fasting prepares us to stand against what we can't stand against in our own strength. Amen. And it is interesting to read this text. And to read that Jesus, he was weak in his body, but strong in his spirit. Mm -hmm. He was weak physically, wow. but he was strong in spirit to not only resist the temptations and the tests of Satan, but also to do it with authority. Yes. You see, fasting will strengthen your inner man, even when your outer man is weak. In this world that we live in, it is a twofold world. 
This world that we live in right now, it is, it, it, it is a two-tiered world. There is a world that we interact with. You came, you came in this building, you sat down, you felt the chair. That's the natural world, amen? Mm -hmm. There's a natural and there's a supernatural world where Satan primarily operates in. And by way of our natural senses, we have no visibility of the supernatural world. We cannot interact with the supernatural world. We cannot impact the supernatural world by way of our natural senses. I cannot physically, with my eyes, look into the supernatural realm and see what the enemy is doing. It's not possible. And so Satan operates in a world that we have no jurisdiction over. Mm -hmm. That's why Jesus referred to Satan as the prince of the air, the prince of the supernatural realm. That's why the book of Revelation tells us and prophesies how that Satan will fall from the heavens. He will fall from his current place of authority. And this is why the word teaches us over and over again about the supernatural world. Look here, look here at Ephesians 6, 12. The Bible says, for we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood. Flesh and blood. You can say we wrestle not against the natural world, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, the Bible says, take unto you the what? Whole armor of the natural world? No, the whole armor of... God, it's supernatural. That ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. You're going to stand, amen? Mm -hmm. The Bible teaches that there is a world beyond flesh and blood that, that we ought to be warring against. Look here at 2 Corinthians uh, 10, verse 4. Or verse 3 for 5. 3 through 5. It says, for, we, for though we walk in the flesh that's a natural for though we walk in the flesh we do not war after the flesh and so when somebody is trying to get under your skin when someone's trying to get under your nerve when someone is trying to try your whole salvation <laughs> you need to say hold on what is the enemy trying to do here the Bible says, for though we walk in this natural world, we do not war. We do not fight after this natural war. And then look, look here what the word teaches us. For the weapons of our warfare, they are not natural, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Our weapons are mighty, supernaturally mighty through God, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Look here at... Uh, 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 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, think it not strange the fiery trials that are to try you. So Peter is saying, look, there are some things in your life that will happen to you where, where you will say, why is this happening? Why is this happening to me in the natural? But Peter says, but, but, but he says, don't think it's strange, but rejoice. And as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his supernatural glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with exceeding joy. And so Peter is saying, don't think it's strange that when these things happen in your life, don't think it's just a natural happening. The enemy is working against you. Amen. Look here at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The Bible says, for the word of God is what? Quick. Powerful. And powerful and sharper, and sharper than a two edged sword. Now, watch this piercing even to the dividing of, of, of what? Soul and spirit. So, the word of God. So, 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 one, so the, the Bible is saying that, that, that the word is spiritual in nature. Amen. The, you see, and so the Bible reminds us over and over again that we, we are fighting against the enemy in a different world. Are you following me today? Notice how all these passages refer to a supernatural area of operation that we are not naturally privy to. Understand this, the supernatural, the supernatural realm, the spiritual realm can easily see into the natural realm. And the supernatural realm can easily impact the natural realm. Because the supernatural realm is the parent realm to the natural realm. It is superior to the natural realm. But the natural realm is blind to the supernatural realm. We feel the impact of what happens in the supernatural. We feel it in this natural realm. Yes, 
We feel the impact of what Satan is doing in the supernatural realm against the life. Have you ever been in, have you ever been in a situation where you just feel the weight of it on you? And you just feel heavy. That is the enemy attacking from the supernatural realm, affecting you in the natural realm. But the fact of the matter is, we cannot fight back from the natural realm using natural tools. Amen? Amen. I can't take up a... L l listen, I can't fight using natural tools. But what fasting does is fasting gives us, gives us powerful access into the supernatural realm. If Satan is messing with your life, the best thing you can do is hit him back with a fast. Amen? Hallelujah. Fasting, therefore, isn't a pious exercise to grovel before the Lord. But fasting is a weapon that carries a potential to put the enemy on his back. Yes. And so not only does fasting prepare you to stand against what the enemy is doing in your life, but fasting will also prepare you for what is coming in the future. For Jesus went into the wilderness to fast because he was about to be tested like he's never been tested before. And when Jesus came out of that test, he had more power than he ever had before. In other words, when you fast and you pray and you make it through your test, you will come out of that with more power than you ever had in all of your life. Amen. Additionally, fasting is not only designed to help us to withstand, but it is also designed to empower us to go from defense to offense. Fasting enables us to exponentially increase the power and effectiveness of our spiritual weapons. I'll say it this way. Uh, 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 I'll say it this way. When we pray, it's like driving a car at 80 miles an hour. When we add fasting to our prayer, it's like going 200 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Fasting will take what is, what is already powerful spiritual weapons and make them increasingly powerful and increasingly effective, mm -hmm. specifically in the supernatural realm. Amen. Allow me to share how this works. The Bible tells us in Romans 8, 7, it says the carnal mind is what? Enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So the Bible is saying that the natural is, the, 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 the natural is hostile. Our natural selves, we, it is hostile to that of the spirit. The flesh, our fleshly nature, is hostile against the spirit. And this is why the Apostle Paul teaches in Romans 7. I think we all can, I think we all can relate to this, amen? Romans 7, Paul says, For that which I do, I allow not. For that which I would, that I, he says, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. How many people know how that feels? Mm-hmm. And verse 6, he says, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it, is, that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but what? Sin. Sin that dwelleth in me. For he, said, for he says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform it, or, or sorry, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Look here at what he says in verse 19. I think we, 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 we've all experienced this. For the, for the good that I would, I what? I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is not, he says, it is not no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I find the law that when I would do good, evil is what? Present with me. That is so true, amen? Amen. This is what we call our sin nature. Mm -hmm. This is called our sin nature. It is a supernatural trait that is tied to our natural selves. And a lot of people, listen to me closely, a lot of people struggle and feel guilty about their sin nature. But I, but I want you to see what the Apostle Paul said in the same chapter, but in verse 14. He says, for I know that the law is spiritual, but I am what? Carnal. Carnal. And he said, sold under. under sin. 
We are sold under sin. When Adam and Eve ate the fruit, we were sold to sin. Sin took over and we were born and shaped in sin and iniquity. iniquity. So therefore, as long as we are in this body, we will always battle with the choice of right or wrong for the rest of our earthly lives. So true. Can I be honest with you for a moment? Don't judge me, okay? <laughs> when somebody cuts me off on the road, my first thought isn't God bless you. That's not my first thought. I'm a believer. I love God. I believe. I, I pray. I see. But when somebody, when I'm driving and somebody cuts me off, my first thought isn't, well, the Lord keep you and bless you. That is not my first thought. And you see that, that right there is, is my sin nature. That's my sin nature. It's just not in me just to be like, well, God bless you. You know why? Because you cut me off. What kind of foolishness is that? <laughs> Amen. I, I, that. <laughs> when I when I'm walking into a building and I open the door for the person to walk in, I stop my forward progress to hold the door for somebody and they walk in like I'm a, like a, like I'm an Old Testament slave and just walk in and don't even say thank you. The flesh in me wants to grab them, drag them out the store, close the door, and let them open that door themselves. That right there is my sin nature. That, I mean, the thought is there. The, my anger, it's there. My blood starts to boil. It's there. I'm, I'll be honest with you. When I'm having a disagreement with my wife, that happens sometimes in marriage. Amen? Amen. <laughs> When I'm having a disagreement with my wife. Confess. <laughs> she said confess. When I'm having a disagreement with my wife and, and I realize on the rare occasion that I'm wrong. There's something on the inside that, that says find some way to prove that you're right. <laughs> find some way to prove that you're not wrong. That's my sin nature. That's pride saying don't admit you're wrong. Amen? Our sin nature will always be present with us. Uh -huh. And understand this. Our sin nature only becomes sin when we act on it. Uh. It only becomes sin when we obey its bidding. And so when I'm driving and that person cuts me off and that thought in me says, what a wretched this, uh. now if I act on it and I, what's wrong with you? you gotta, now, now that's it. Mm -hmm. Some, I, I hold the door open for somebody, they walk by, I say, you're rude, what's wrong with you? Get, go, get outside and that's, that's sin. If we obey the bidding of our nature, our sin nature, that is when it becomes sin. If we dwell on our sin nature and, and, and if we allow that sin nature just to grab a hold of our soul, that is when it becomes sin. But Romans 8, 12 says something that I believe is worth considering. The Bible says, therefore, brethren, we are not debtors to the flesh. We are not debtors to our sin nature to live after our sin nature. The Bible is saying you don't owe anything to your flesh to obey your flesh. You don't owe anything. You are not obligated. You are not in debt to your sin nature. Why? Because of Jesus Christ, he paid it all. Amen. And so we don't owe anything to that sin nature to bow and to obey and to do its bidding. Our sin nature or our flesh operates based on its goal of, of subjecting us to our basest nature. People who you've seen, done, people who you read about doing heinous crimes, evil things, these are people who have surrendered their lives to their nature of sin. You read the wicked things people do. You say, how is that possible? They surrender themselves to their sin nature and sin just takes completely over. Uh -huh. For the flesh is at war against our created good Jesus. to take dominion 
over our innate desire to do God's will so that, so that we are subjected to the flesh. I remember watching, um, I remember watching this, uh, this show about this serial killer and they couldn't find this man back in the 70s this serial killer, which he was just killing people, boom, 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 killing people. One, one particular family, he killed the father, the mother, the son. He brought the daughter downstairs and hung the daughter, six years old. Jesus. And out of nowhere, he stopped. And then 13 years later, out of nowhere, he starts sending letters to the police and to the, and to the, and to the uh, news agencies until they caught him. And when they caught him, you would think he was upset that he got caught. He sat there gloating about his work as if it was art. Jesus. He, he basically said, what took you all so long to catch me? Mm. That is somebody who has given themselves full-throatedly to their sin yes. nature. And this is why we fast. This is why we fast. Because we cannot allow our sin nature to dominate our lives. Amen? Amen. And the truth is we cannot fight. We cannot fight in the spiritual realm with a baseball bat. We cannot fight in the spiritual realm with medication. We cannot fight in the spiritual realm with self-help books. We cannot fight against the spiritual realm with, 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 with modern day philosophy. It doesn't work. The exercise of fasting is powerful because what fasting does is fasting will force your flesh, your sin nature to be subject to the spirit. Your body will say, feed me, feed me. And you're saying, no, I have food you know nothing of. You can sit there. I am filling myself with the spiritual things that I need. I'm filling myself with spiritual food, with spiritual sustenance. That, that is what fasting does. Fasting practices killing the flesh, putting our sin nature under the dominion of the Spirit of God. And this is why Jesus, again, and this is why Jesus, when, when he was sent, that he was physically weak, but he was spiritually strong. You see, the closer you are to God is the stronger you are against the work of the enemy. Amen? Amen. And so when you fast, it draws you nearer to God. And fasting will greatly increase your spiritual awareness, your spiritual sensitivity, and your spiritual soberness. And it will also increase your authority and power. And so when you pray, when you pray, that will increase your spiritual impact in the supernatural realm at, at, at a level six. But when you add fasting to your prayers, that will increase that number to about 30 and upwards. When, when you worship, you can feel the presence of God. But when you are in fasting and you worship, you will literally feel God like a temperature change. Yes. Amen. When you read the word, you glean lessons from the scriptures. But when you're fasting and reading the word, it is like the scriptures come alive and, and, and the words jump out literally at your face and speak to you. There are many times in scripture where we read that Jesus goes to the mountain to pray. But Jesus is not only praying, he's fasting. He's fasting. And we, and we therefore learn the last important lesson I want to close with about fasting it is this. There are certain victories that we will never have unless we fast. There are certain victories that we will never have unless we fast and pray. That's what Jesus says here in Matthew 17. It says, and when they came, he says, and when they were come unto the multitude, there came unto him a certain man kneeling down. He had a knee praying, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and he is sore vexed. And for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. And then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Now look at what the word says. Jesus rebuked the what? Devil. Now, what did the father say? He said, my son is what? Lunatic. He said, for he's a lunatic. 
But in verse 18, Jesus rebuked the devil. devil. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus did not rebuke the natural manifestation. The natural manifestation of the, of the demonic possession of that boy was lunatic. He was a lunatic. He was, he was crazy. You see, we tend to call people crazy and we try to medicate their craziness. No, we need to cast the devil out. Amen. Jesus did not say, well, you lunatic. Come. No, he cast that devil out. Amen. Amen. And he, the devil, departed from him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples apart privately. They said, why could we not cast them out? So here the Bible is clear. The disciples wanted to cast them out. Mm -hmm. The disciples had the desire to cast them out. Yes. The disciples believed in the Lord. But what happened? They said, why couldn't we cast him out? Few things here. Jesus says, number one, because of your what? Unbelief. Now, don't miss that. He says, because of your unbelief. Faith is a foundation, amen? And fasting is powerless without faith. So true. What, is, what, is, what does the old song say? Only believe. Only believe. Only believe. All, All things possible. are possible when you only mm -hmm. believe. Now, what's interesting here, the word unbelief, I said that's, you know, we, we got to focus on the word because Jesus said it is because of your unbelief. That unbelief was the reason. So what does that word unbelief communicate and indicate to us? The word unbelief in the Greek is summed up in these three words, untrustworthiness, untrustworthiness, distrust, and uncertainty. So Jesus is saying, you couldn't do it, the disciples. He said, y'all couldn't cast out this devil because you didn't really trust me. Wow. Yeah, you believe in me, mm -hmm. but you didn't trust what I told you. Wow. Untrustworthiness. Mm. The second word in the Greek was distrust. There was a lack of innate trust. The third word was uncertainty. They weren't certain if their prayers would be effective. Listen, be certain your prayers are effective. Amen. Your prayers are effective. Amen. They were uncertain. And when I dug in more to the definition there, it also communicated a lack of acknowledgement of Christ. There are people who try to do things of themselves. Remember the three men of Sceva when they tried to cast that devil out of that man? They said, Jesus, we know. Paul, I know, but who are you? They were trying to cast out the devil with, with a lack of the acknowledgement of who Christ actually is, and they lost that battle. We have to acknowledge the full ability of who Christ is in our lives. Amen? Amen. That word also communicated a lack of confidence in Christ's power. Listen, trust God. Cast not away your confidence in Christ. Amen? Amen. And so Jesus said, because of your unbelief, because you didn't trust me, because you were uncertain, you couldn't do it. Let us make our fasting effective by maintaining our faith, amen, and trusting God to do what he said he will do. Yes. But notice what Jesus says at the end of this statement. So he says, because of your unbelief, but, but jump down to verse 21. He says, how be it this kind Somebody say this kind. This kind. This kind, Jesus says, goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. And, fasting. And, so, and so what the Lord is saying here is there are things that you can pray for and God, it, it'll happen. Mm -hmm. But there are certain spirits and look, there, listen, there are levels to this thing. Amen. If you remember in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul was traveling everywhere preaching the gospel. And the Apostle Paul was getting set to go into Asia. And the Holy Spirit said, do not go. He said, it's not time yet. Do not go. In other words, Asia was so demonically entrenched that had Paul gone to Asia at that time, he, wouldn't, he, he would not have come back alive. 
And so what and and so what and so what and so what what the scripture shows us is that there are levels to this thing. That's why when we read that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities, principalities powers. powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wicked in high, high places. places. The Bible is saying that there are there is a there is a hierarchy of demonic activity at work. Yeah. And there are certain spirits and certain strongholds and certain situations that can only be resolved by prayer and fasting. Yes. And so when you think about that, we, we may then answer this question, God, why haven't you done it? God is saying, look, that, that thing, that will only change by prayer and fasting. God, how come you, God, how come you haven't done this? Lord, how come you, God is saying, you got to dig in and you got to fast and pray about this one. Amen. For this one, this, this kind, this kind cometh only out by prayer, prayer and fasting. And fasting. Mm. So the truth is we may be praying about something that we need to be fasting and praying about. Amen. Oh, amen. And so, and so I want to encourage you today to fast. If you are on medication, consult with your physician as to what is possible. There are, there are different kinds of fasts. There are absolute fasts, no water, no food. Absolute fast. If you're doing an absolute fast, I encourage you, make sure you're not leaving your home. This is Florida, it gets hot. I, I don't need you passing out and going to heaven early, amen? So if you're doing an absolute fast, stay in your house, turn the air conditioner to a comfortable place, and you can fast. There's partial fast, where you do not eat food, you only drink liquids. That's the most popular fast. Where maybe for breakfast, you fast breakfast. Maybe you fast lunch. Maybe you fast dinner. You can fast a meal and you take and you substitute that meal, that physical meal, with a spiritual meal of prayer and the word. Right? There's a Daniel fast where you eat, where, where, where you do not eat meat. You only eat vegetables. No sugar. Daniel, uh, they, they did not eat any of the king's dainties. So no donuts, no black cake, no, no bun and cheese, none of that. It's just vegetables and water. There are different fasts that you can do. When, um, when David counted the census and sinned against God because David wanted to boast about his large army rather than depending on the arm of the Lord and wrath the wrath of God was poured out upon Israel. David had to atone for his sin. And David had to buy a field where he would offer the sacrifice. And when David and his contingent went to the field, the owner said, look, O king, take the field. David said, no, I will not offer to God what cost me nothing. And that's the mentality I want you to have with your fast. Don't say to yourself, well, you know what? I'm going to fast... Uh, I'm going to fast for meat when you barely eat meat anyway. <laughs> right? No, you got to say, you know what? I, I really love, you know, pasta. So let, let me fast from all that and only do vegetables. Offer to God will cost you something. Uh -huh. One meal a day. Maybe two meals. After you, after you begin to learn how your body responds, maybe you can fast for 24 hours. And as we make fasting a part of our lives, we will sense the power of God rising yeah. in us. We will sense the presence of God rising in us. We will see things change on the inside of us and not just us, but the people around us. And I'm telling you right now, there are things that we've been praying about that if we begin to fast and pray, you'll see change. Thank you, Jesus. And so one thing that we're going to do in this church that I want to announce every Wednesday is going to be our day of fasting. Every Wednesday is going to be our day of fasting. And you can fast by the leading of the Lord. You can fast breakfast, lunch, dinner, and make sure you take time out to pray. And bring before the Lord whatever the issue is. Bring before the Lord whatever the challenge is and confidently go before God and fast and pray. Watch what God will do. These things come not out but by prayer and fasting. Amen? Let us stand. We're going to pray today.
Amen. We're going to pray, then I'll let you go home to eat. Amen. Amen. I want you to, this week, develop a spiritual strategy for fasting and prayer. Identify in your life the situations that are worthy of fasting and prayer and begin to lock in. The more serious the situation is, I encourage you to fast longer if you can. And dig in in prayer and read the word. Use all the tools that God has made available to you. Maybe you just want to draw nearer to God. That's a great reason to fast. Just to draw nearer to him. Amen. That's a great reason to fast. Bow your heads. We're going to pray today. Father, we recognize this is not particularly a shouting word but a word that is timely and needed. You taught us here that there are certain strongholds, certain challenges, certain issues that will only come out but by prayer and fasting. And Father, today we re-adopt fasting as a key integral part of our spiritual experience. And so Father, help us to be cognizant of this weapon of warfare, yeah. fasting, and help us to couple it with our prayer. Help us to couple it with reading the word. Help us to couple it, oh God, with worship and take us to new levels. Yes. For indeed the enemy is like a flood trying to overwhelm us. Indeed the enemy has surrounded us like hungry lions. But oh God, we take confidence in your word today that you've given us power over all the power that the enemy possesses. And we will thereby embrace fasting to heighten and to increase the power of your presence in our lives. And so, Father, I pray that you would speak to your people based on where they are today. Yes, speak to them today. Yes, that, as we enter this, that as we enter into this week, we will prepare our hearts to fast. That we will prepare our hearts to turn our plate over and to seek your face. And I pray, Father, as your people fast and pray, open the windows of heaven and shower down your anointing. Open the windows of heaven and shower down your anointing. Open the windows of heaven and release your divine authority in their lives that they would walk in dominion, that they would walk in your power, that we would walk in your divine authority causing every devil, causing every demon to bow to the authority that you are in our lives. Thank you. Heavenly Father, empower your people today. Thank you, Jesus. And I pray right now that you'd fill their hearts with hope. Yes, Lord. That, as I, that, that, that God, as they identify the difficulties that have been in their lives for years, as they identify the challenges that only seem to be getting worse, that they would rejoice to know that, that they have a weapon that will sever the head of their Goliath and cause them to walk in their victory. And so, Father, strengthen them now today and prepare our hearts to draw near to you. Prepare our hearts to encounter you. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we all say, Amen. amen. Come on, clap your hands for the Lord today. Amen. 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 We want to thank those who have joined us across our social media apparatuses. We thank God for you. If this message has been helpful, if, if, if this message has been eye-opening, please share it with somebody. Hit, just hit the share button when this, this uh, video cast is done and share it with somebody to minister to them. Maybe you can't help us financially, but you can help us with a share. You can share it. You can help us by spreading this message around. And if, you, and, and, and if you do not know the Lord, pray this prayer with me. We want to bring you into this kingdom to make these spiritual weapons available to you. So just pray these words and repeat this after me. Father, I recognize that I am a sinner. And that I need your help. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me thoroughly. Cleanse me through and through. Be the Lord of my life. I welcome you in my heart. I surrender to you. I am yours. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are now part of this kingdom, please send us a message so we can come alongside you, pray with you, encourage you, and strengthen you. Again, thank you for joining us, Lord Terrors. We will be back next week. We're praying for you. We love you. God bless you. See you next week.